Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But what of this Bible? Can I believe it? Is it accurate? Is it just for children who don't know any better? Hey, did someone steal books right out of my Bible? Did you hear that serious differences exist between certain versions of the Bible? Did you ever wonder why? Did you know that some Bibles have more books in them than others? I mean, why do Catholic Bibles have so many more books than Protestant Bibles? Who's right? What happened to the books mentioned in the New Testament that can't even be found in modern Bibles, like the Book of Enoch? If these things bother you or you want some answers, you come to the right place. Welcome to Crosstalk. The English Bibles we read are excellent representations. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. How did they turn the known world upside down? My name is Randy Weiss, and I hope this missing books of the Bible stuff interests you. I guess we should start with a book in every New Testament known as the Acts of the Apostles. You see, it details the first 30 years of Christianity. And it's from this book that we learn how the church grew and developed after the death of Jesus Christ. You see, he died in the Gospels, but the story wasn't over. After his glorious resurrection, Jesus had more to say. And it feels good to remember that in my red letter edition of the Bible, the book of Acts still has red ink identifying the living words of our living Savior. Of course, the red ink came much later after chapter headings and the maps at the back of the book. The New Testament is more than a last will and testament or the final words of a dying man. It's not an epitaph. It's a living legacy. The men and women in the book of Acts didn't worship at grave sites. The tomb became the womb from which Christianity emerged becoming the most vibrant world movement in the history of man. And here's a thought for you to remember. The New Testament church didn't have a New Testament, but we do, and they're good ones. The apostles weren't endowed with Thompson chain reference study Bibles or 40 pound multi-purpose Strong's concordances. And them puppies are, well, you, They'll make you strong if you read them or you just carry them around. They certainly didn't have their Bibles on their cell phones like most folks today. The apostles didn't use neon highlighters to underline their Torah scrolls and compare notes in the margins either. Actually, without these modern study tools, it's amazing the apostles ever got beyond tent evangelism, let alone started churches. What was their secret? How did they turn the known world upside down? The answer is really simple. They knew Jesus. That was the key. When Peter and John got arrested for healing the man born lame and then converting 5,000 Jews after their release from prison, the high priest and the Sanhedrin could only proclaim they had been with Jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. Holy Ghost power and being with Jesus are still the only answers for effective Christian living and ministry. These Jewish saints read their Bible and temple and preached Jesus through the words of Moses. They also were familiar with many other Jewish sacred writings. I think it's good to remember that for their inspiration, the early Christians primarily read the Old Testament along with some Jewish apocryphal books, pseudepigraphical works, and ancient Jewish apocalyptic literature. And by the way, when a fella starts using those six syllable 50 cent words, he should take a breath and explain them so everyone understands. Words matter but they're worthless if they're not understood. And this explanation will also answer the question as to why some Bibles have more books than others. Catholic Bibles 
contain the Apocrypha. Protestant Bibles do not. Or do they? Hmm. The Apocrypha is a body of ancient Jewish historical writings dating back to between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. The word Apocrypha comes from the Greek. It means hidden or secret. Now, I'm not suggesting that some hidden secrets are contained in the Apocrypha. Rather, I'm just pointing out that the early Jewish believers in Jesus were familiar with the ancient Jewish Apocryphal literature. Though these writings are considered a sacred part of the Catholic Bible, neither modern Jews or Protestant Christians include them in their Bibles. However, in antiquity, they were included in the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible known as the Septuagint. And this was a version of the Bible read by Jesus and his Jewish disciples. So ancient Jews and the early Christians were well acquainted with the Apocrypha. You may also be unaware that for centuries, many Protestant Bibles did include the Apocrypha in its pages. In fact, though you may find this surprising, the Apocrypha was actually included in the original 1611 King James Bible and remained as part of countless authorized King James Version Bibles until the late 1800s. Now, please don't misunderstand these facts. Though these books were often printed within the Bible, directly between the divinely inspired Old Testament books and the equally inspired New Testament books, the Apocrypha was not considered part of the Protestant canon of Scripture. Canon is another important word. It also comes from the Greek. It means rule, as in a measuring stick, like a ruler. In other words, we can be confident that an inch is always an inch. A foot is always a foot, just like a ruler can be trusted as a legitimate standard of measurement. We can trust the canon of Scripture. Conservative Christians may argue about interpretation or theology, but the canon is widely accepted and has stood the test of time for more than 1,600 years. So what about these other books loved by Catholics but not included in our canon? The historical value and the importance of the Apocrypha should not be minimized. As I have often reported, Jesus celebrated the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. You can read about it in the 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. But you should also be aware that without the book of Maccabees contained in the Apocrypha, neither the Jews or the Christians might have known about the Jewish festival that celebrates the rededication of the Jewish temple that followed the abomination of desolation perpetrated by Antiochus Epiphanes in approximately 167 B.C. You see, we have a history. Without books that commemorate and explain our history, our corporate memory could disappear. And with these and other ancient writings, the heroes and the villains of our human experience might have also dissolved into the mist. We must remember that the era surrounding the time of Jesus was populated by many folks in Israel who had clearly defined apocalyptic ideas. A change was certainly going to come. A violent change was expected. The widely held belief certainly included the early Jewish Christians. Similarly, the sectarian Jewish scribes among the Qumran writers were not the only Jewish elite who anticipated a cataclysm. We can read of such expectations in the numerous Qumran fragments. This is a community of Jews who lived out in the Judean desert. It is known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. These came from that region. The Dead Sea Scrolls reveal various Jewish writings classed as pseudepigrapha, and apocryphal works that proved these writers carried with them a sense in which the end was coming. And even more relevant to Christians, 
we should all recognize that the apocalyptic end of this age was sensationally predicted in the revelation of St. John the Divine, also known as the revelation of Jesus Christ, or you might just call it the revelation, found in the last book of our New Testament. However you describe it, the messianic hope burned brightly during the darkest days near the end of the apostolic era. More about that era in a few minutes, but for now, what's up with those writings known as pseudepigrapha? What were they? I think more definition might be helpful. You might notice the word sounds similar to pseudonym. Most folks understand that a pseudonym is a pen name. Mark Twain is the pseudonym for Samuel Clemens. In ancient times, some religious writers used pen names so that the Greeks, the Romans, or the mainstream Jewish religious leaders of the day would not kill them for putting their contrary opinions into writing. As you might guess, it was not healthy to speak truth to power or to write books that were critical of those in control. Nevertheless, a fairly robust religious literary genre developed within ancient Judaism, promising a better time to come and punishment for the oppressors in power. The pseudepigrapha were usually attributed to famous biblical characters, such as righteous Enoch or Baruch, the scribe of Jeremiah. This had a twofold purpose for the author. First, it help the, the writer garner more respect for the new book than a work presented by the local kosher butcher. After all, if ancient Enoch had really written a book and it was suddenly on sale at the local newsstand, people would want to read it. And second, it also protected the author from being executed by the people he criticized. No one was able to trace the work back to the actual writer whose identity was protected by the pseudonym. Yet sadly, the author's real identity was ultimately lost to history. I mention all of these things because our own New Testament was birthed from this Jewish world that expected a soon coming change to be brought by a soon coming Messiah. It truly was a messianic age inhabited by Jewish men and women who were waiting for God to install a new world order. They were familiar with the concepts of ageless battles being fought between the powers of light and darkness. In the sectarian writings of the Dead Sea Scrolls, good and evil were manifested in the heavenlies and also in the earth. Angels and demons became focal points in the teaching and the psyche of the Jews and early Jewish Christians of the time. We should recognize that the New Testament writers were familiar with these teachings and probably held similar expectations. The early Jewish writers of the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha expected a radical change in governance, in religious structures, and in the coming kingdom shift in which they hoped to play a part. In fact, some of these non-biblical writings are actually quoted or referred to in our New Testament. I'm not making this stuff up, it's really true. Reread the little book of Jude near the back of the New Testament. When you realize that Jude was referencing information well known to him and to the other Jews of his era, that little book will make a lot more sense to you. References to texts within Jude are made about the book of Enoch and the assumption of Moses, which fill out the short little work inspired by God, but believed to have been penned by the younger half-brother of Jesus. Now let's face it. If you're paying attention, this stuff should be interesting. And make no mistake, unlike the Catholics, I do not suggest that the Apocrypha should be included in the canon of Scripture. It does not belong there. However, as with all works of the intertestamental era, I feel they are important, but not inspired. Interesting, but not inerrant. 
Okay, in case that word went by you, the period of time generally known as the intertestamental era is simply that time between the close of the Old Testament, about 400 years before Christ, until the beginning of our New Testament era and the apostolic age. It is from the midst of this so-called silent era that many of these fascinating Jewish writings were authored. As previously explained, the writers were convinced that bad things were coming down the pike. The revelation that closes our New Testament is unique, terrifying, and profoundly hopeful in its prophetic expression from God. May I say, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. But the revelation is not alone in its apocalyptic worldview held by oppressed Jews and expectant Jewish Christians at the end of the first century. Earlier writers also expected catastrophic events to signal a cataclysmic conclusion to that evil age. Their works presented the emotion, drama, and mystery associated with the bold expectation that the world as they knew it would end in the one promised by the even earlier Hebrew prophets would become a reality. And that is the reason I have taken the time to explain a little bit about this literature. The early church read the Torah, our five books of Moses, the Nevi'im, our holy prophets, the Ketuvim, our wisdom writings, such as Psalms and Proverbs. These are known as the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Ketuvim. But they also knew of other ancient Jewish historical writings that informed them of things the modern church has forgotten. All of this Jewish literature influenced these churchmen, and that influence should be better understood. One thing that we have in common with those ancient writers is that many of us and many of them agree, we live in perilous times. I am convinced that God is preparing to bring an end to this world system. Like them, I want to be spiritually prepared. That is why I study the Bible. How about you? Well, now that we have a better idea of what Jesus and his disciples read, what did they write? Conservative Christians generally agree that our New Testament was authored by the disciples of Jesus and his apostles. Paul is believed to have written nearly one half of the books in the New Testament. Much of his work is known as the epistles that were written in letter form. I remember hearing a baseball coach at a Baptist university I attended tell some of his students that prior to his conversion, he thought the epistles were the wives of the apostles. <laughs> they were not. Well, anyway, some of these letters or epistles, as they're commonly called, were intended to be read and circulated from church to church to church. These types of letters were classified as encyclical epistles. Other letters, like the short pastoral epistle to Titus and the two epistles to Timothy, were personal letters of instruction from Paul to his students who were learning and working in the ministry. The New Testament was actually written during the apostolic era, which ended with the death of the apostle John around the year 100 AD. But like I said, the New Testament church didn't have a new Testament. The Bible as we know it today was not available to the apostles or to their disciples. The time period in which this second generation lived is known as the sub-apostolic era. It lasted until 156 AD. The sub-apostolic era ended with the death of a famous early martyr named Polycarp. Polycarp was the last living disciple of the last living apostle. In other words, by the end of the first century, John, the last disciple of Jesus, was dead. John had personally taught Polycarp. He 
Polycarp carried on the tradition from John's direct first-hand information about Jesus Christ. When John's student, Polycarp, was burned alive at the age of 86 because he wouldn't deny his faith in Christ, the sub-apostolic era officially ended. Now, please remember, the writings of the apostles remained unchanged and intact, but they still weren't all in one volume called the New Testament. In fact, that book was not completed in canonized form until the fourth century after Christ. Nevertheless, since we have nearly 6,000 ancient Greek manuscripts from the New Testament writings, we can be confident that we read the accurate words of the apostles written nearly 2,000 years ago. In case you missed the broadcast where I explained about the doctrine of biblical inerrancy, please take a look at our YouTube channel, like it and subscribe. All the details are there and they're free. You can also listen to our In Studio with Randy Weiss podcast. It's all free all the time and it's all pretty important stuff. Main thing is you can trust your Bible in all matters of faith and practice. The English Bibles we read are excellent representations of what God preserved for us from the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek manuscripts from which translators have faithfully delivered the Word of God to us. The reason I have spent so much time discussing ancient writings from forgotten ages because some of you must learn to pass these truths on to others. It is important to understand the expectations of those people who followed after all the firsthand witnesses to the life of Jesus had died. We have the testimony of those who had been taught directly by the apostles. We can rejoice that a generation of faithful teachers carried the words of those apostles. And when they died in the faith, God made certain that those same teachings would live on so we could believe and carry the message of the gospel forward. You see, God never changes and his word is intact. On this, believing Christians agree. Now, one thing that is unique and different is the way in which God responds to each of us as individuals. You see, each of us has a unique relationship with God. And each of us experiences life with Him as individuals. God is big enough and He loves us enough to reach out to each of us where we are right where we are. And he does so in terms that are meaningful to each of our life situations. He even adjusts his way of touching us to fit our life stage developments. You know, as children, we can know the simplicity of God and Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. As young adults, we can relate to learning to lean, learning to lean, learning to lean on Jesus. Finding more power than I'd ever dreamed. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. Then, one day we're parents trying to shepherd our own little flock. And as we begin to figure out how it works, well, we try to teach our beloved children what it means to live for God with all our hearts. We want them to know that it's simple, it's basic. It's something real and tangible. Like the prophet Micah asks and answers, what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God? You know, kind of just be a good human being. It finally becomes clear that 
we must trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And then the cycle of life seems to turn faster and we get closer to knowing Jesus in different and even more intimate ways, ways we can't teach. But we hope our children catch from us. We pray that even when the words won't materialize, somehow the truths are gleaned by others as they identify our, our peace with God. Even that peace which seems undeserved, security in the midst of turmoil, calm in the whirlwind of earthly struggles, safe, though in harm's way, we learn to have confidence to cease from our own works that we might rest in His and in Him. Slowly, we begin to understand how those who went before us sang with such loving confidence about the Savior of their soul, and then you realize that in truth, He's the Savior of your soul. Though some white-haired saints look forward to few tomorrows, they seem to reflect on so many treasured yesterdays in Jesus. And as the aged begin to look to the old rugged cross and they quietly glory in the reward that awaits them, they return to singing. Jesus loves me, this I know. <laughs> For the Bible tells me so. You understand why we need a firm foundation? Do you see the need to confidently rest assured that you have just such a resting place in your own personal Lord and Savior revealed by God in the Holy Bible? It's true. Jesus is Lord and he desires to meet each man, woman, boy and girl right where you are. I hope this resonates with you. I pray you trust and read the Bible and if you don't have a Bible and you want one, please let me know. I'll find a way to get you one. I want you to know Jesus because Jesus loves you just as he loves me and it is the Bible that tells me so. Till next time. Shalom.